everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and in this video, we're going to do something a little different. See, I just got my new Nikon D850, and I've had a lot of requests for an unboxing video, as well as a video that shows how I initially set up the camera. So, we're going to do both at the same time. This is just going to be a very simple video, since now that I have the camera in hand, I'm anxious to start putting it to use. So, let's go ahead and start with the unboxing part, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this box around and I have a camera above me too to kind of help us out so you guys can see what's going on right down here, but I'm going to go ahead and open it up and let's see what we have. We have our warranty card right here, our instruction manuals, and by the way, these will ever remain wrapped. I don't ever take them out of the plastic because I always get the PDF and I put it on my computer, on my phone, much handier. You can search it, so hopefully that'll be a good little tip for you there. Let's open up the inner layer here, and as you can see, we have the 810 right, or I'm sorry, the 850. I do that all the time. We have the 850 right there. We have all the accessories. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the accessory part first. Let's see, the first thing I'm going to pull out is this little plug. This goes with the with a battery charger, no doubt. And let's see what else we have here. Not here, it, here, here's the battery charger, right here. And this plug, obviously, plugs in like so. Uh, I have a little cable clip thing here for it, of some sort. Don't ever use that myself, so I don't know exactly what it's for. Um, USB 3 cable. We have the official Nikon D850 strap. Uh, I actually don't use straps either, so you know what? I'm just going to end up putting that back in the box. But, you know, if you want a D850 strap, you know you have one there. And finally, of course, we have the new ENEL15A battery. So that's kind of the, uh, the warm-up here. Let's go ahead and grab the camera out of here. All bubble-wrapped. Very nice. Unwrap it here very briefly. And there we go, the new Nikon D850. It's got the little snap bridge, snap bridge thing here for whatever that's worth, right? Uh, it's got a little protective thing on the back. Kind of satisfying to peel that off. Camera, initially it feels real good in the hand, but the first thing we need to do is set it up. So let's go ahead. I'm going to hook this up to my HDMI capture so you guys can see exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to go through, set up all the menus. Let's do that right now. Okay, for the next part of the video, I'm going to plug the camera into my output capture device. I'm just going to go ahead and plug that in right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to capture the back screen here as I go through and set up the camera. And I'm going to give you a brief explanation for each thing I'm changing and why I'm doing it. But first, a few quick notes. All right, these are my settings and they work well for me. I'm setting this camera for wildlife photography and for my own personal preferences. So please don't feel like if you're not doing it the exact way I am, you're somehow wrong. Please set your camera the way that works best for you. Second, I will only be giving a very brief explanation for each setting I adjust, not a fully detailed description. Just a quick how and why for this particular video, nothing too in depth. And finally, keep in mind that this is just my initial setup video, and you know what, things may change as I shoot. I've only had the camera for a few minutes now, so there's a good chance I'll be making some adjustments as I go. Also, make sure you check out my field report for this camera in a month or so, maybe six weeks, after I've had time to really put this thing through its paces. By the way, now would be a great time to subscribe if you don't want to miss that video. So, we have the camera plugged in, let's go ahead and I'll go through setup with you. Okay, so I pressed my menu button and the first thing that came up is language, as you can see here. So since this is already in English, I'm not going to worry about changing that. And once again, I'm only going to show you the stuff that I change, the stuff that I don't change, we're just going to skip right over. So the first thing that I'm going to change is the time zone and date. That's very easy to do. We just press that. And I'm going to start up here at the top with time zone. I am in the eastern time zone. so. I'm going to scroll over to that. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And we'll have our time zone set. Next, let's go ahead and do date and time. And it is about 7 o'clock on the 8th of... There we go. I'm not worried about the seconds. Again, make sure you hit OK or these won't stick. 
Next, we have date format. I'm pretty happy with day, month, year. I'm not, you know, going to go crazy over that. But if you'd like to change it, you can do it there. Daylight savings time. I'm going to go ahead and turn that on since I am currently in daylight savings time. And since I changed that, it made it 20 instead of 19 for my time. So I have to go back and knock that down there you go see isn't this great you get to see all my failures too as we go here let's go ahead and continue to go through the setup menu here i don't really change any of the stuff here generally let's see here oh copyright information yeah let's look at that one real quick i'm going to go ahead and click that and i want to attach copyright information so i need to put some information in here artist using that term loosely with me, but we'll go ahead and put that in there. Thankfully, this has a touch screen, so this makes entering this stuff much easier. So there we go, and I'll hit OK. Always remember to hit OK. And we can attach the copyright information. I'm just using the touch screen to select that. And now we also need to go to copyright and put that information in. So we want to, it's going to be copyright 2017, since that's the current year. And I'll put a space and my name. And I'll hit OK. And now I have copyright 2017, Steve Perry. And I'm all done. So I always like to put my copyright information in there so that it's automatically embedded into the EXIF data for all my files as I shoot them. So that's pretty cool. Let's see. We'll go down here. Touch controls on. Yep. Uh, here's another one I like to change. Airplane mode. I usually like to go ahead and just turn that on or rather enable it since I don't generally use the Wi-Fi features and the other features, the wireless features that the camera has. This way, they're not in the background using any power. Uh, there was an issue with that with the D500, so I just automatically turn airplane mode on unless I'm planning to use Wi-Fi. And let's see here. Not seeing anything else. Nope, that's it for the setup menu. So I'm going to go ahead and go over, and we'll go all the way up to the top and just kind of go through these one menu at a time, and I'll show you all the different stuff that I set. So we'll start back up here and uh, go through it. So going down the playback menu, there's not a lot that I change in this particular menu. One thing that I do change, however, is the playback display options. When I choose this, it gives me some options for how my photos can be displayed on the back of the camera. I can scroll through things and see things like as you, you know, focus point, highlights, RGB histogram, that sort of thing. Uh, I do like to see the highlights and I do like to have the RGB histogram. I actually like to have image only. I'm gonna go back and grab that. Uh, shooting data, I do sometimes like that. Overview, I'm not quite as worried about. Maybe I'll go ahead and check that too. And what the heck, we can also go ahead and do focus point. Sometimes I don't really use focus point though. So, but you know, it's up to you if you want to use it or not. Sometimes it gets a little tedious to have to scroll through all those screens. So anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and check all of them for now, I guess, and just hit OK. Let's see, next we have rotate tall. That's the next one I like to change. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn that one off actually. Now, this is really a personal preference thing. I like it when I shoot a vertical for the vertical photo to take the entire LCD up just like it would if it were horizontal. What Rotate Tall turned on looks like is this right here. I'm going to show you a screenshot right here. And I don't like that format. I like I like to see the whole thing. I don't like that rotation there. So I go ahead and I have it so it looks more like this. Because most of the time if I'm shooting something vertical, that's the camera orientation I happen to be looking at the photo in anyhow. I'm usually on a tripod. So I don't want it to rotate. So I shut it off. Uh, obviously your choice on that. So let's go ahead and head down to the next one. I think that's everything for the playback menu. And here we are in the photo shooting menu. And I'll just kind of skim through here. Again, there's a few in here that I use, but not all of them. The first thing I like to do on this is go to file naming. I have, I don't know, probably eight or 10 Nikon cameras sitting around, all of which want to say DSC at the front of every file. However, if I'm looking through just a folder on my hard drive, it gets kind of difficult to figure out which DSC I'm looking at. Was that from a D500 or D810, D850, whatever. So I go ahead and I rename that to something else. In this case, I'm just going to call it 850 and hit OK. So now all my files will start with 850 and then whatever the file number is. If I get a second D850, I might name that one 852 or something like that so that I have a reference. I just like to have unique names for my cameras. Next, let's go ahead and scroll down. Image quality is the next one I would change. Right now it's on normal JPEG. Obviously, I want to shoot straight up raw. 
For JPEGs, I'll just export JPEGs from Lightroom later on. I only shoot raw. So go ahead and hit OK on that one. And let's go down to raw recording. I just want to verify that it is using compression. We don't want to have compressed. We want lossless compressed. It's important that you have lossless compressed. That's how it's set up from the factory so you're good to go. You can do uncompressed if you want, but lossless compressed does not lose any data and it's a smaller file size. So I don't really see a lot of reason to use uncompressed. I always use lossless. So that's correct. We also have the bit depth we can change from 14 bit to 12 bit if we prefer. 12 bit will give you a smaller file size. So if you need more room in your buffer, you can actually go ahead and switch to 12 bit. So if you keep hitting the buffer with 14 bit, but you do lose some plasticity when you're trying to process your images. So I always shoot in 14 bit if I can, that way I can push and pull shadows, highlights, that sort of thing. So let's go back. Okay, next is ISO sensitivity settings. Now, one of my favorite modes is manual plus auto ISO. Now, you can go ahead and watch my video on that to find out why I shoot it. It's absolutely awesome. I'll just give you a spoiler alert there. Really great way to go, but uh, we're not going to go into that now, but I do want to set it up right now. So I'm going to go into here, and the first one is ISO sensitivity. This is your base, and I want to go ahead and knock that all the way down to 64 since this camera can do it, and hit OK. Now, auto ISO sensitivity is off. I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. I can easily shut that back off again if I want to. So if I want to go full manual or if I want to have control of my ISO, I can easily go back and change that. Maximum sensitivity is at 25,600. That's the maximum for the camera without getting into the high range. Since this is a new camera and I'm not used to shooting it, I'm going to drop that to 64 for right now. I think that's probably safe. I will give you a full report on how high I think I can set this camera after I field tested it for right now. I'm going to start at 64 and see how it goes. So that's pretty much it right there. Now there is a minimum shutter speed option right here. And the thing is, I don't usually, I, you know, I'll just leave that on auto. It doesn't really matter when you're using manual plus auto ISO. It, you can, whatever shutter speed you set on the camera is the one it's going to use. It's not going to use this. It will use this shutter speed if you're using it in aperture priority, which is a whole different ball of wax there. But anyhow, just wanted to touch that real quick. Uh, let's go down here, set picture control. I usually like neutral. It gives me a little bit better idea when I'm looking at histograms. They're a little bit closer to the range that I can get with my raw files, although they're, they still do fall short, but it gives me a little better uh, idea there. There's also flat if you go all the way down here. I don't really like flat too much. It just makes the pictures on the back of the camera look depressing. So we'll go ahead and stick with neutral. And let's see, anything else that I change in here? No, that's it for that menu. Let's go ahead and go down. I'm not going to do anything in the movie shooting menu right now. So we'll head to the custom setting menu next. And there is quite a few that I change in here, particularly under autofocus. Okay, so let's go to autofocus. And now before we begin, I do have a confession. I went through this menu before I recorded this clip and checked out all the custom functions. As it turns out, each and every autofocus custom function is already thoroughly covered in my Nikon AF book. We'll be going over some of those right now, but for a complete explanation of how each and every one of these AF custom functions work, and more importantly, what they can do for you, be sure to check out the book. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look. We have AFC and AFS priority selection. Those are set to release and focus as they should be, so I'm not gonna mess with those. Next we have the focus tracking with lock on section, and this causes quite a bit of confusion, so I wanna go over it briefly. So when we select this option, you'll see that there are two choices, one for blocked AF response and one for subject movement. The first one, blocked AF response, is similar to what we had with previous models like the D810, the D750, D4, D7200, etc. This option tells the camera how long it should stick with the first subject before it tries for a new lock when there's a significant change in focus distance under the AF area. For instance, maybe you're photographing a bird as it flies by and a tree comes between the two of you. Should the camera maintain the focus distance it had with the bird or go for the tree? If it sticks with the bird, how long should it do that for? That's what this setting controls. The higher the number, the longer the delay. There's actually quite a bit more to this setting than we really have time for here in the video, but my Nikon AF book will go over it much more thoroughly if you'd like to take maximum advantage, but I think this kind of gives you the idea. 
Next, we have subject motion with the choice of erratic, steady, or right there in the middle. This tells the camera what to expect when a subject is coming towards or away from the camera. If the movement is smooth and predictable, like maybe a race car, steady is a good choice. If you have fast starts and stops, erratic is a better choice. I like to think of using erratic for something like a long jumper. Maybe he's facing you or you're facing the long jumper. He jumps in the air, he's in the air, the camera's tracking that, then he comes to a sudden stop when he lands. But most of the time, I find leaving this in the middle works pretty well for my wildlife photography work, but, you know, I do change it from time to time depending on the circumstances. Now, my basic defaults for blocked AF response, it's set at 3, and I think that's good for most people. For myself, I think I'm going to put it down at 2, so I'm going to go ahead and select that and hit OK. And let's go back down our menu. We have 3D face detection and tracking watch area. Oh, that's good. Store by orientation. This is one of my favorite features here. I'm going to go ahead and click this. It gives us an option for focus point or focus point and AF area mode. I'm going to go ahead and select that one. Basically what that does is it remembers where your AF point was when the camera was horizontal and where it was the last time it was vertical. And when you select it with the area mode, it'll also take the area mode with you. So for instance, maybe you were shooting at the top of your viewfinder with your camera oriented vertically and you were in single point mode. And then when you go horizontal, maybe you were in the center of the frame and you were in group AF mode. Well, as I switch from vertical to horizontal, it'll go ahead and flip flop back and forth between the two, remembering where I was and what AF area mode I was using when I was in horizontal and when I was in vertical. If that's confusing, check out my uh, video with the seven Nikon tips in there. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the description area on YouTube. It goes over it much better than we can in this video. So anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and set that. And we have AF activation is set to on. This is actually for back button focus with this camera. I'm going to go ahead and click that. As you can see, shutter slash AF on. This means that the AF on button or a half press on the shutter release will activate my autofocus. Since I'm a dedicated back button AF shooter, I'm going to go ahead and go to AF on only, and that will disable the autofocus on my shutter release. So the only way I'll be able to focus is with the AF on button on the back of the camera, just the way I like it. All right, limit AF area mode selection. This is another one I like to go ahead and fiddle with a little bit. There's certain modes that I use and certain modes that I don't. What this does is it will allow me to shut off the modes that I never use so that I'm not cycling through them when I'm trying to select my modes. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to get to a particular AF area mode and not be able to because you're you know going past a bunch of stuff you never use. So uh, let's see, dynamic AF area 9, I'm going to keep that, 25, 72, 153, I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that one because I just don't use that. Uh, 3D tracking, I don't really use it. I know a lot of people like it for wildlife. I don't like it very well, so I'm turning that one off. Group area AF, I definitely use that. Never use auto area AF. And obviously, I can come back in here if I need one of these modes and reselect it. But for right now, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit OK. Next, we have autofocus mode restrictions. I'm going to go ahead and click this. I'm going to explain what it is. Basically, this allows you to select either AFS, AFC, or no restrictions. Whichever one of these you select, AFS or AFC, that will be the only AF servo mode you can use. Now, for a lot of people see that and say, well, why would I ever want to do that? Well, as a dedicated back button AF shooter, I only use AFC. So I always come in here and select AFC and click it. Now, when I do that, what that means is that I will no longer be able to select AFS. Now, it doesn't seem like maybe it's that big of a deal, but what happens sometimes is we press our focus mode button and we're trying to change our AF area mode, and sometimes you inadvertently bump that rear command dial and you go from AFC to AFS, and you don't know that you did that, so now all of a sudden you can't figure out why you're not tracking your subjects anymore when you're doing action shots, and it's like, what's wrong with the camera? Well, the problem is you went to AFS instead of AFC. So personally, for me, I go ahead and select AFC here so I don't accidentally end up in AFS. Now, if you don't use back button AF, please don't do this. Leave it to no restrictions. But if you do shoot back button AF, this, uh, th th this might be handy for you. Next, we have focus point wraparound. I always leave that off. And finally, we have focus point options. There's just a couple of things in here. Take a quick look. We have uh, focus point illumination auto. I don't like focus point illumination. Again, personal preference. I don't like the little red flashes in my viewfinder, so I just shut it off. Um, 
Manual focus mode on and dynamic area AF assist that is on. If you turn this off, all you will get when you're in like D9 or D25 is just the single point. This allows you to, when it's turned on as it is by default, this shows you a little outline of just where the dynamic area extends. So I highly recommend you leave that one on and that's it. So let's go down to our next section, metering and exposure. Uh, for the most part, I just leave pretty much all of this alone, I think. Yep. Uh, let's see, timers, nothing there that I'm worried about. Shooting and display, continuous slow, shooting speed. ISO display, that is one that I actually change. Uh, again, I shoot manual with auto ISO. And if I go ahead and show ISO sensitivity, I'll actually be able to see the ISO sensitivity in my viewfinder rather than it just flashing auto ISO. So I prefer to go ahead and turn that one on. Let's see here. Electronic front curtain. I always go ahead and enable that. There's no reason not to. It only is active in live view. So I just go ahead and turn that on. It doesn't affect anything for normal shooting. Let's see here. Viewfinder grid display. That's another one that I like. I like to have a grid in my viewfinder. It's very helpful for wildlife. It allows me to very quickly kind of judge if it's level or not in there. I find it easier to do that with the grid display on. Some people find it distracting. Again, my settings, you guys do what you like. Uh, let's see here. Flash sync speed. I want to make sure I have auto FP enabled up here under 1 250th of a second. That allows me to actually shoot faster than 1 250th of a second. It does reduce your flash distance, but it's very handy if you need to use fill flash and you're at maybe 500th of a second or something like that. So I go ahead and always make sure that auto FP is on. And let's go down here a little further. Custom control assignment. That's probably my next one to assign here. I'm going to click that. Right now, I'm only going to select the PV button because I know what exactly what I want it to do. I'm not sure what I want my function button to do. By the way, this is the new menu. If you're not accustomed to this from the D5, D500, or D7500, if you don't have any of those cameras in the 850 is the first time you're seeing this, a brief explanation is probably necessary. On the left side here, we have just what happens when we press a button. And on the right side, we have what happens when we press the button and spin a dial. So you have two options here. You can only use one usually. So I'm going to go ahead and hit my PV button. That's on the front of the camera. And what I'm going to do is have it choose an AF area mode. I usually like to have that choose single point AF. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. Now a quick note here. What will happen when I do that is when I press the button, you can see it on the screen there where the camera has it highlighted in yellow. If I'm in group AF mode, for instance, maybe I'm doing action, I can press the PV button, and as long as I'm holding it down, the camera will switch to single point AF, just like it does on the D5 and D500. Very, very handy. One of my favorite features. And also, I wanted to point out that this isn't always necessarily the way I have it set. Right now, I'm just putting in single point because that's what I have it set at most of the time. But if I'm shooting something in single point and I think I might need to maybe shoot some action, I might also go down and maybe use this one as group so that when I'm shooting my single point stuff and maybe I'm doing mostly standing birds or standing animals and if somebody runs, I can just mash that button and I have a little bit larger area. But for right now, I'm going to go ahead and select single point AF. And the FN1 button, I don't think I'm going to reassign anything else at the moment right now. I think that I'm just going to leave that alone because I don't think I see anything else that I'm desperate to change, at least not right this second. But if you want to change that stuff, it's right in here. The multi-selector center button is next. Uh, let's see here. What do we have under shooting modes? I think that I usually use preset focus point on that. I'm going to go ahead and select that. Uh, let's go ahead and go to playback mode here. Zoom on or off, and I like that to go to one to one. That'll give me some magnification. So when I'm playing back my photos on the back of the camera, I can just press the center of the multi-select button, and it'll zoom in at 100%. I find that very handy. Live view, I like to do the same thing. I like to have it zoom in to 100%. So if I'm looking at a image on the back of the camera, I'm using live view, I can go ahead and just press that multi-select center button and it'll zoom in for me. Very, very handy for focusing with live view. So let's go ahead and go down here. Uh, let's see. I'm not, I'm thinking that's about it. 
And that, yep, that'll do it. So that's the basic setup for my camera. Uh, I'm sure I'm gonna be changing some of that stuff as time goes on, but I just kind of wanted to walk you through that. Hopefully that wasn't terribly boring. I know it's kind of tedious just looking at this and listening to me drone on, but uh, you know, hopefully that helps you. So there you have it. I hope it helped. And as I mentioned, stay tuned for the field report. It's gonna be a real good one. Also, I know I mentioned it earlier, but if you're thinking about getting a D850, you should really check out my ebook, Secrets to the Nikon Autofocus System. It covers all the D850's AF custom functions and everything you read in that book about the D5 and D500 AF system applies to the D850 as well. Plus, about half the book is full of tips and tricks for getting sharper photos, a perfect match for the D850's 46 megapixel sensor. Finally, keep in mind, again, that this was just a warm-up. I'm going to take the camera on the road for about a month or so, maybe up to six weeks, and I'll be giving you the full field report afterward. Um, I know my reviews don't come out as quickly as some other channels do, but I like to really test drive the camera and really get to know it before tossing out the review. And I'll be announcing that review in my free email newsletter, so be sure to stop by my site and sign up. And also, again, please subscribe to the channel so you never miss a video. And as always, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.